Welcome back to another episode of The Founder, a show that features entrepreneurs and their early stories of ingenuity, struggle, and perseverance to get their companies off the ground. We do our best to capture the uncensored, uncovered look behind the curtain into what founders really face when getting started. I'm your host, Callaway. Our founder guest on today's episode spent his free time in college brewing his own beer. After he was finished with each batch, he was blown away with the amount of grain that was left over. For every six pack he brewed, he had almost a pound of grain that he would just throw in the trash, a byproduct of the brewing process. Over time, he grew uneasy with how much waste the process was creating and wondered if there was a better way to utilize that grain. He started taking the byproduct and used it to bake bread. He would then sell the bread and use those proceeds to fund his beer brewing hobby. Quite the operation. His first idea, naturally, was to start a brewery that was also a bakery so he could do both at scale. But as he started talking to all the new microbreweries that were popping up in 2009 and 10, he realized this was a much bigger opportunity than he thought. And that's how Regrained was born. Today at Regrained, this founder and his team have a lot in the hopper. They've created a patented technology, process, and machine to upcycle wet beer grain into their powerful Super Grain Plus. Now this stuff is no joke as it packs 3.4 times more fiber than normal whole wheat flour with added prebiotics and as much protein as almond flour. Today, they use Supergrain Plus across two different business segments. First, they make their own puffs and bars that they sell directly to customers on their website and in stores. And then second, they have a wholesale business where they sell the Supergrain Plus directly to other food companies that use it in their products. As a special offer, this founder is giving our listeners 15% off all products on their site. Use code FOUNDERPOD15 at checkout to get the discount. This was an inspiring interview that highlights the massive problem of food waste in our country and a company that's taking the challenge head on to do their part to help solve it. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Now introducing the co-founder of Recrain, Dan Kurzrock. Let's get it. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really pumped to uh, go through Regrain today. So before we talk about the origin story and your background, what I'd like to do is start with an anchor point. So can you provide just an anchor point of where Regrain is today? You know, mission, vision, the products you sell, how big you are? Yeah, so today we have two product lines of our own that are out in distribution. And we have a patented technology and we have ingredient partnerships with other food companies that are starting to commercialize new upcycled products. So we are creating a upcycled food economy and it's super exciting. For those people that don't know what upcycled is and and kind of the process that you go through, can you walk people through that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I love explaining upcycling because it's actually a super familiar idea to most folks just with a, a new name. Uh, with, with upcycling, what we're doing is we're looking at resources, basically, and trying to put them to their best use. So as opposed to recycling, where you are maybe recreating something, you know, taking plastic and turning it into more plastic, upcycling creates something of, of higher value. So in the case of food upcycling, what we're doing is we're looking at food that has already been used for one purpose. So in our case, we're looking at grain that's already been used by breweries to make beer. They've taken the sugar from it. Rather than have that grain go to compost, for example... What we're able to do is create a flour-like ingredient from that that can be used to make more food. So it's creating higher value. It's it's doing more with less. It's that moment that an old jam jar becomes a cup. It's that moment that your old climbing rope becomes a dog leash. You know, it's it's taking a look at what you have creatively and and finding the way you know the the ways to create the most value from it. And when you think about you know when you compare traditional grain that people would either buy from the store they they buy in pre-made products versus the grain that you're upcycling from the breweries after they've already used it. What's the difference in nutritional value? Yeah, what's what's really exciting actually is that what we're doing is taking, we're creating an ingredient stream that is actually more nutritious than if it were to be the the virgin version of it, if you will. So when you take, so to make beer, you use barley and barley is malted, it's basically a sprouting process. And then it's roasted kind of like coffee. And that's how you get a lot of the different kind of backbone flavors of, of the beer recipe, the, the malt profile, kind of the sweet side, whereas the hops are the bitter side. To make beer, what they're doing is they're taking the sugar from the grain, and that provides uh, food for the yeast to ferment. And that's where we get alcohol, which, you know, 
most of us are, are trying to actually get stuff. after, even if we say we're, uh, we like the taste of, of all these drinks. We also like the way they make them, they make us feel, right? Um, and so the beer making process is really optimized to take the, the sugar from the grain. What's left is all the fiber prebiotics, which is a, a specific type of fiber that doesn't get digested, but it feeds your uh, gut bacteria actually and promotes you know, healthy, healthy digestion and protein and you know other other nutrients. So it's it's actually a concentration of the things that we want to see in food products, you know, fiber, protein with less sugar. Whereas if we had taken a grain that hadn't already been used in the beer making process, it would have still had all of the the sugar basically, you know, in there, the starches. Yeah. And that's super interesting because I feel like, you know, there's such an emphasis on cleaner eating. And it sounds like this like waste, quote unquote waste product of grain is actually better for you. Is that yeah. there are other ways to take the sugar out other than like a beer making process? And it, it, it's a it's a good way to put it because it's really looking at when you create a product, are you actually creating two products? You're just not recognizing it as such. Like waste is such a human idea. If you look at nature, there's there is no waste, right? A tree dies in the forest, it falls, and a, you know if you, if you look up like a nurse log, you can see like an old redwood tree, and there's new growth that's coming out of it, right? There's this idea of uh, it's actually called you know biomimicry, which is like looking to to nature for inspiration for solving you know human problems. It's this idea that waste equals food. We just take that pretty literally. So it's not, there's no reason to try to like extract these sugars, you know, just to create the grain. It's like, we like, we like drinking beer. We've been drinking beer as a civilization since as long as humans have stayed in one place. And we can get into that if you, if you want. There's pretty interesting history between the relationship of, of humans and agriculture and beer brewing and consumption. And so every time you make, you make beer, you're going to make this food supply. And so what we're doing is we're saying, hey, let's come up with new creative ways of putting it to bet, you know, to the best use as opposed to kind of finding the path, path of, of least resistance and just, you know, sending it off to, you know, compost or animal feed or, or landfill. And it's, not, and it's not even that the breweries are being wasteful. I like to be very clear about that. Making beer uses a lot of resources, but they're actually very efficient at what they're doing. Generally, brewers are, you know, care a lot about the environment and environmental stewardship. It's just that the beer making process creates two products. It's kind of like with cheese making, you know, a lot of people don't realize that with all the whey protein that we see in all these, you know, supplement products, you know, fitness products, you know, whey protein, you see it in it's ubiquitous in the grocery stores. Whey protein is a byproduct from cheese making that became so valuable that it's a co-product. And now there's actually whey producers where cheese is the byproduct. And what we're trying to do is map out all the opportunities like that, that are kind of going, you know, un, unseen in the food system and putting them on the table, so to speak. Yeah. I'm, I'm pumped to shine a light on that. Cause I feel like that's a complete you know, way of thinking almost when it comes to food and, and growing agriculture that people have no idea about. So I'm, I'm pumped to get into it. I think that'll provide a good anchor point. So kind of rewinding the clock, I'd love for you to start with, you know, your background, walk us through your, your life and background leading up to where you got the idea for Regrind. So I was born on a cold November day. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so so the, the, the genesis of what we're doing with, with Regrind did not really start from a explicitly like altruistic mindset where I was, you know, trying to start a social venture or anything like that. I was actually just a, I was an undergrad at UCLA. And when I was a freshman, I learned buddy how to make my own beer. So we were 19 years old, basically learned that there's a loophole effectively where you're, it's perfectly legal to buy the equipment and ingredients to make beer. Oh, if you're under 21, <laughs> if you're under 21. Yeah. And you're just not supposed to drink it, which of course we never did, right? It was just about the, the process. Yeah, of learning it was, how to make it was it. for testing only. For te testing only, for the love of the process. And got really into the hobby of, of making beer, as you might imagine, because um, it's actually not terribly difficult to do. If you can make bread, if you can follow a recipe, you can make beer. And then, you know, all the kind of skills get get developed from, you know, that, that, that baseline of, of just following instructions. But I was blown away by every time I made a batch, how much grain I was using. So we'd be doing five gallon batches. So to put that in perspective, think of a standard keg. It's about a third of that from one batch of beer. And to do that, we would fill, if you picture, um, you know, like a sports match, you know, on this, like a Gatorade cooler on the sidelines. Yeah, that full so of the, grain. That, yeah, the equipment is actually a modified version of that. And that, that full of grain, 20, 30 pounds of grain comes to about a pound per six pack for an wow. average brew. And I grew up in Northern California very progressive, I guess, environmental, sustainably minded household. Didn't even realize that was just kind of normal, right? It was just growing up around that and going to school in an environment where we didn't even have a compost, you know, compost, um, let alone, you know, my dad's vegetable garden to put like, you know, coffee grounds and things like that. I actually had the, the just the, the visceral experience of taking this vat of food and 
dumping it, you know, tipping it into the dumpster every time I made a batch of beer. So my love for the hobby of making beer was kind of paired with this distaste for, you know, it felt like, um, it felt like I was making a big batch of oatmeal basically and tossing it and wondered if there could be a better way to do it. And I learned that there was a history of brew pubs and, and home bakers, you know, taking the grain and just mixing some of it and bread recipes and pizza doughs and things like that. And so what I started doing is making loaves of bread and then selling, I couldn't sell the beer because uh, I wasn't supposed to be drinking it, but I could you know, sell, sell the bread that was a little less, less shady um, and use the proceeds from the bread sales to buy more ingredients to make more beer. And the first version of the regrain concept was, okay, this is, this seems viable. Like what if we started a brewery that was also a bakery and you always have a time to go in and it'd be a great community center. We kind of stamp these out, you know, around the country and it'd be, could be incredible. Um, and, but in the end to kind of starting on to think about the, the business plan for that I was looking around this is 2009, 2010 craft beers blowing up, you know, more than two new breweries were opening per day on average, a lot of them opening up in cities and started talking to brewery owners and learned that craft breweries, especially urban craft breweries, also weren't doing much, you know, with their grant. It actually was a, a cost center in some cases, you know, for them. So they had to pay to get rid of it? Like yeah, yeah, in some cases. Historically, you know, there's been kind of a symbiotic relationship between ranchers and brewers. You know, the ranchers would come, they'd pick up the grain and, you know, feed it to, you know, cattle or, or pigs or, you know, whatever they're, they're raising. Um, in some cases, picking it up for free, in other cases, buying it. But yeah, in an urban environment, not, not super practical to do that. And Pound per six pack. I mean, that adds up to tens of billions of pounds of grain generated by the industry in the U.S. And so, just kind of kept following that line of thinking into, you know, how can we make a business that solves an environmental problem with one hand and you know is profitable, you know, on the other. And this was well before finally food waste has entered the kind of national dialogue, if you will, the global dialogue. You know, food waste is one of the leading contributors to to climate change or climate chaos, as I like to talk about it. I mean, it's. Forty uh, percent of all food that's grown is wasted. You know, it's like leaving the grocery store with five bags and you know dropping two in the parking lot, right? And it's it's just massive. But no one was talking about that then. It just was common sense. It was hey, every time we make beer, we've got all this grain. If we can put it to better use, we can fund our hobby. You know, and if we do that on a bigger scale, I mean, that it just seemed to just make sense. Just clicked intuitively. Yeah, it's crazy that no one was utilizing, or I'm sure some breweries here and there were, but at a mass scale, no one was utilizing all that grain. Is it hard to take that byproduct and put it into flour to make bread? Like, is there an extra step you have to take? Or is it as simple as treating it like normal grain? Yeah, no, it is very difficult to deal with. That's part of the, you know, part of the challenge. So yeah, one of the things that we sought to do pretty early on is figure out, okay, why has no one done this before? It seems like a pretty obvious idea. You know, part of it is that beer makers are in the business of making beer right? They're not food companies. Um, and they need to, they need to get this stuff out before they can make more beer. And the material, you know, this, uh, the, the grain that's been used in the beer making process, it is soaking wet. It is like 90% water by weight. It is, it is literally like, think picture oatmeal. That's like, that's what it looks like. It's just barley instead of oats, which also means that it's heavy, right? Wet things are heavy, difficult to transport. Wet things also, when they're food, you know, they're also spoil a lot faster. You know, think of a, piece of fruit on your counter versus a piece of dehydrated fruit on your counter, right? Which one's going to go bad first? And then picture that on a much, you know, more accelerated scale. Uh, and so what we learned is that there had been trouble in the past and having like a, a energy efficient, which also translates to like economically viable way to take this grain and stabilize it so that it doesn't go bad in a way that's cost efficient. And so we had to figure out how to do that in order to scale our business. And the way we did that is actually kind of interesting if you want me to, to get into it. Yeah, yeah, dive into that. I'm, I'm really curious. Is that where the patent lives? Yeah, so we actually partnered with the government. I love that. <laughs> yeah, which, uh, you know, started from, so the USDA, um, US Department of Agriculture, they have an arm called the Agricult Agricultural Research Service, the ARS. There's going to be a lot of acronyms in this uh, this little section of the, of the show. Yeah, the CIA and FBI have monitored our trucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the USDA ARS has a research facility in Albany, uh, California, which is like basically North Berkeley. It's, it's effectively Berkeley that has a team there focused on he uh, healthy processed foods. So now we've got the USDA, ARS, WRC, uh, health, uh, HPF. <laughs> we're loaded up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're on a roll here. Um, and they actually had, it turns out that they had a, this is like 16 clicks into their website. Uh, the, a friend 
had had done a tour there for my my grad school program, and he's the one who told me about it. Or I would have never found it. They have a they had a program uh, around taking sources of plant based waste and creating novel ingredients, which is like a super nerdy way to describe upcycling, right? Um, and so I wrote the director of the research center a cold email. Actually, heard back within a day, you know, asking us to come in because it's exactly what they exist, you know, to work on is to work with private sector companies solving problems that they that they care about under um, collaborative research agreements. They're actually called a, a CRADA, co-research and development <laughs> agreement. And so we we got into this this research arrangement where you know we brought them this problem of hey we've we've got this great idea you know there's all the, it's really well documented the nutritional benefits of, of brewer's grain. And they said, hey, this is, this is, we can help, you know, we think we know how to do this. And, you know, we did a, a lot of, you know, R&D together effectively over a few years and invented an, a new way to process this material that was novel enough to get patented and is really powering, you know, everything that we do. So like Regrained is really a, a food technology company first, you know, we use our technology to create ingredients and then our ingredients become, you know, finished goods, which is part of, part of the, you know, the broader strategy to like build this market, build this movement and you know, get this stuff into every aisle of the grocery store. So I'm guessing the the novel system that you guys created had to be mobile, right? Because you had to take it to the breweries or does the grain stay, you know, doesn't go bad quick enough where you can truck it out? It's a good question. So I have this, I have this vision for mobile regraineries, you know, that we can bring all over the world. And with, with, I still think that that's something that we can, we can do someday. The first version of it is a centralized facility. So we just have, a, you know, like we, it's the regranary. It's in Berkeley. We have about a hundred breweries within ten miles of our of our facility. You know, there's which is crazy. There's yeah, there's, so just many a, there's just a ton of breweries. We only need a few um, to have enough supply. Um, you know, so we have some great partnerships with breweries that are uh, primarily canning or bottling their beers, right? So they're making the same beers in the same way every single time, and we've got access to consistent supply. And we do it. We do it there. Uh, we can also, for larger breweries, take our technology, and it is it is modular. In nature, so it's not today. It's not mobile per se, but it's um, it can be deployed, if you will, as a um, like a standalone unit, like at, at the point of production potentially. You know, so there's kind of a, a few different ways that it can be commercialized at, at scale. But at present, it's um, our own facility. So what's that process look like? Try to describe it in in layman's terms. Yeah. In the facility, so like the wet grain comes in, then what happens? Dry grain comes out. That's the yeah, that's way it. To think about it. Yeah, it's it's obviously it's a little more complicated in between. You know, it's a it's a thermomechanical process. There's a lot of controls around making sure that we are stabilizing the material without like burning it, which would create off flavors, for example, and not like neutering the uh, nutritional profile of it. But it's you could think of it as a as as a linear process where you know the the fresh wet grain goes in one end and it comes out in big ass bags dry the other end, and then you know that the and then it gets you know milled into a powder from from there and further used in recipes. Walk through the timing. So 0809s when you like realize this, how long were you like doing the bread making and and just funding the hobby? And then how long were you working on this? And then once you had this, was that like 2015? Yeah. So so it remained uh, like a bread making thing for the you know remainder of college. So I, I graduated you know, to get my undergrad in, in 2012. That spring, my co-founder and I did an entrepreneurship class, and we focused on the business concept. And that was where we first realized, okay, the idea, we called it, it was called Bruin Bread originally, like you say, like Bruins and Bruin Beer, so clever. And that's when we first uh, realized, okay, this opportunity is much bigger than just having a closed loop operation. Like this could be a platform, you know, for connecting the dots between companies that already make food. And the producers of the, you know, of the byproduct, the breweries, and that, that's what became regrained, um, and where we realized. But in order to do that, first, you know, we need to have a, a viable, like, proof of concept product that's out there. You know, we were re- reading like the Lean Startup and all that, all that good stuff. And so that's when we came up with the bar, blew our minds. We could make a hundred of them in an afternoon and package them by hand. And you know, I was like a granola dealer in my fraternity house in college. It was hilarious. You know, people would come and like buy little baggies of these bars. And you know, eventually did farmers markets and, and and things like that. But we were already thinking through the bigger model, you know. Then I'm mean, identifying kind of what what our business would need to to scale. But the, but we decidedly we're not going to turn our noses at you know corporate jobs and go all in. And you know, there's all these like romantic stories about you know if you believe in your idea, drop everything and get after it. It's like if you don't, like 
what are you doing? You know, and then and, and for us, we just thought that was ridiculous. Like we were young, we needed to learn about the world. We we're pretty sure we had a great idea, but we still had a lot. We just still had a lot to learn, frankly, and to to work out. And so we both got jobs um, and focused on this as as a hobby. I you know I call that period our recreational entrepreneurship days. We just loved what we were doing. We'd spend our nights and weekends working on it. We'd spend an entire weekend, you know, preparing a batch of bars to sell at a you know, at a farmer's market or event, you know, sell out of them the next weekend, you know, we built our website and just kind of like made, made progress, you know, for the next few years, um, all the way up until 2014, when I felt like the business really needed, you know, a lot like full-time attention, um, but also still, you know, wanted to invest in our ability to be successful by going to get a graduate degree. And so I found this sustainable business school program in, in San Francisco called Presidio Graduate School, which is very focused on environmental entrepreneurship and came in there with this idea that I wanted to take to be something that was, you know, that could be a viable full-time venture by the time I left. And so it was a 22 year program, you know, full-time MBA. So it was like full-time MBA, full-time entrepreneur at the same time. And also like doing a, a like a consulting side hustle, you know, I did a little bike delivery also, which is like a way to get exercise and make some money. (laughs) Yeah, it was was a blast, honestly. I miss it in a lot of ways. And then in 2016, finished that program and, you know, had the business plan we needed and and proof points we needed to go out and raise our first round of of capital, which would enable us to focus on it full time, make our first hires, things like that. And so the business really became like a full time, you know, the, the traditional like when did you start your business? I always have a really long answer because of everything we just talked about, but it was really like the beginning of 2017 that things started, you know, in, in earnest, you know, really moving, moving forward at a exciting rate. I mean, I have so, so many, so many follow-up questions off that. So you mentioned like today at, at full tilt for what you guys are, you only tap into the breweries that are within a 10 mile radius. And I, I mean, there, there's like thousands of breweries. So this opportunity is still so untapped, right? Like what you guys are chasing, you're still just in the infancy stages. Good choice of words with untapped. Yeah. So we, at this point, we actually do have, um, you know, we took strategic investment from a number of places actually, but one of them is Molson Coors Brewery. So we do have our eye on, you know, the, the larger industry. We're relatively ag- agnostic as to like who we take grain from. They're not going to be an incredible global partner, but everywhere that beer is brewed is everywhere that like humans live, right? It's a staple of, um, our diet for, <laughs> for better or worse, you know, it's just our, you know, our recreational diet. And so we, you know, are not even close to tapping the, the full potential of the, the beer industry. But what's really exciting, too, is that our technology actually works really well for other streams. So, like, we can take uh, oat milk, huge category right now, right, um, for, you know, alternative dairy. You know, it's, I think it's the best tasting. I mean, I've had almond, almond milk, soy milk, you know, all these oat milks, uh, you know, it's the kind of barista's choice. And everything else kind of followed. And, and, and when you make oat milk, guess what? You've got oats left over from the process. Same with like juice, you know, uh, my favorite example for juice is like carrot juice, right? So carrot juice, you have you know, carrots, which is you know, a lot of fiber and a lot of, a lot of good stuff in them. And so we're really blown away and humbled by how much work there still is to do and, and, and tapping the, the brewing industry, but also just how much opportunity is just within, you know, the food upcycling world, you know, overall. Is the constraint today that, you know, you can only process so much raw grain in your one facility, or you can only sell so much of the end product right now because people taking that grain is still a small market? Like what's the, what's the constraining factor for you guys today? Yeah. So it's, it's all about like sequence, right? So we're, we're, we've now solved how to scale supply and we could, you know, we, we could, with our one machine and one facility, we could have literally like close to 10 million pounds of super grain plus, you know, a year with just one machine. That's, I mean, that could be a pretty large business in and of it, in and of itself. It's the demand side, you know, so you think of a market, you know, and this is a, this is a missing market. We're creating a market uh, for this new supply. And so it's on the, the demand side of getting other companies to buy these ingredients and in food. It's not like software. It's like a pretty long development cycle two two three years to get something to market in a lot of cases, especially with the big food companies. And so we're spending most of our time, we set up the the relationships to do that, getting into the R&D, exactly. And we've got some products that are going to hit them at the shelves next year. You know, we could, I mean, we could have, we could have dozens of them today if we just wanted to work with every corner bakery and and things. And we we do want to do that eventually, but we'd like to, we're trying to to build a real market here. And so we're focused on, you know, think of it as like enterprise level 
yeah kellogg's and like the big huge yeah, players all, all the ones you'd think of you know and there's um you know for both uh, cpg so consumer packaged goods but also like restaurants and you know and things like that any any food producer because this super grain plus can be used in fresh baked goods pizza doughs you know but also like all kinds of snacks it can be used in beverage um, we have a ice cream concept that's in the works you know there's there's really a lot that can be can be done with it and so it's about finding all the different ways that it can be used you know honing in on the ones where it should be right and you know which to do first um and then as it's, we'll, we'll start to see for successful you know it'll it'll hit a point of like exponential growth on the demand side and then we can you know meet scale up supply our, scale up supply exactly yeah so looking at your guys's mix right now, right? You have the you have the puffs it, like in the bag, right? You have the mm-hmm. bars. So you have your own products and then you of course you sell the raw grain. Were those to like bide time or like to prove out that you could make a product with it? Yeah, to to build the market exactly. It's like, you know, how can we uh first of all prove that well, we wanted to learn the first step was just learning, right? Like will people buy this? So and when we can make something ourselves, you know, super fast, you know, we can have a shorter uh, development cycle. So it's about proving the market build, and building the market, you know, generating awareness, you know, and recall from, from customers. Cause like our vision is to be like the Intel inside for food. So when, a, you know, someone's walking down the grocery store shelves and they see a product that's like powered by regrand, that needs to mean something to them. Right. And they need, they need to learn what upcycling is. Like we've been a huge voice in creating this movement around upcycled food and our consumer brand has been the instrument to do that. Um, you know, it gives us a, uh, it gives us a megaphone to, to, to talk about upcycling and the benefits and, you know, both from a health and an environmental perspective. And then it also allows us to generate short-term cash flow, right? So these sales cycles are super long. We're not going to see material revenue from the ingredient business, you know, so we're, you know, it's 2020 now, we started in 2017. We're just now starting to commercialize some of these partnerships on the B2B side. And it's still going to take a few years before they really start to take off. And so we can generate cash, you know, through, through sales. Uh, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot though, a little bit with our bar, but we're, we're really like hardcore about our values and we didn't want to use plastic packaging and use compostable packaging and ended up having to do a product recall, uh, what we call the voluntary product pull. You don't use the R word, <laughs> and, uh, but stay away from you, the R word. Yeah. So yeah, there's been a lot of like trials and, and tribulations uh, along the way. One thing that I like to get into on the show is like marketing tactics that people use to you know, acquire customers, spread the word. For you guys, the education around upcycling, I think is is the critical thing. Can you talk about what are some of those tactical things you've tried to increase the education awareness around your consumer brand and upcycling as a concept? Yeah, it's um, a lot of that, that trial has happened under our under our consumer brand. Um, I think if you just look at our branding, actually, that's 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 one you know angle we could talk about there. So like the first thing we did, we came up with this really clever tagline, eat beer. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I do too, frankly. It turns out we learned that it confuses consumers. It worked like super well live. Like if we're somewhere and we have that on a sign, it gets people's attention. You draw them in and you explain what you're doing. And it's it's actually, it's beautiful for that. On a package though, when you don't have it, people are like, oh, does this have beer in it? Does it have alcohol? Can I give it to my kids? Does it taste like beer? Is it bad for you? You know, all these yeah, it just it didn't it didn't it didn't it didn't work in the same way. It works well, great on a t-shirt and on a and on a hat and, and you know things like that. But um, that's just an example of you know how we like you can use our consumer brand to test messaging. So we've learned that, for example, like upcycling is and there's now market research data that supports this on a on a bigger scale. But like people do are interested in upcycling. They're interested in like actually even taking a step back, they're interested in ways that they can use their purchasing power to support like more sustainable solutions, right? And in some cases, they'll pay more for products that are better for the environment, you know, food, you know, upcycling is a part of that food waste. But there's, there's also this like interesting challenge to think about it, like, how do you communicate the environmental benefit of what we're doing without yucking people's yum by talking to them about like food waste, you know, you don't want to be eating food waste, right? Um, so that was something to think through and, you know, the ups, using upcycling instead of like repurposing or other language, you know, was deliberate, you know, around that. And then, you know, from there, it's like, okay, well, what's the reason for purchase? You know, are you going to get people that are buying this because of the mission behind it? And what we've learned is that the mission is, is really important to some people and is the reason to purchase for like a smaller set of really progressive consumers. It's more of a reason for loyalty. You know, the reason for purchase is like great tasting products that are 
you know, have the right nutritional attributes and the fit people's lifestyles, right? So like, if you look at our brand today versus what our brand looked like, like two years ago, it's much more focused on like active, healthy, fun, flavor forward. It's, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, comparison that I like to draw all the time. And I probably lifted it from someone. I just don't remember who is like, you know, thinking about like Tesla cars and how their success. And it's like, people aren't buying Teslas because they're electric. People are buying. Yeah. They're buying Teslas because they're awesome. Because they're awesome. They're fast, beautiful cars. They happen to be electric. Right. And so what's the equivalent in the food world of that? And that's kind of something that, 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 that we think about a lot and how we position the, the story and the mission and, um, you know, reaching ultimately like reaching customers where they are and making the right choice the easy choice for them. Yeah. Mission seems like a secondary factor in purchase, but like a primary factor in vocalization and like promotion. Like people will always tell the story about like, oh, they're doing such a great thing, but they'll only do that at the table stakes of like, it tastes good. It's like affordable for me. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Agree. And we, and we learned like pretty early on that we had a product that actually took us too long to realize if I'm being totally honest, like we had a product that tasted like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like people loved it when they learned about what we were doing. Um, but we, I, I don't think we were asking the right questions earlier on. Or we did, honestly, we didn't think it was a, the most important thing. Uh, you know, we, we thought the product was good enough and that, you know, we had obviously these broader ambitions behind the, beyond the bar itself. Well, that's, it's fine. Like I, I developed what I call like the chairlift, the chairlift test. I'm a big skier. And, you know, I realized, okay, well, what if I were to hand this product to someone that I just met sitting next to me on the chairlift back when it wasn't gross to share food with strangers, right? Because we weren't worried about COVID. And if they tried it and didn't know anything else about the product, would they think it was delicious, right? And like our first few versions of the product would not have passed that test. You know, taste is in food, taste is king, as it should be. Although some of this keto stuff kind of flies in the face of that, if I'm being honest with you. It's like a lot of bullet, you know, people buying for bullet points of net carbs and things like that. And a lot of these products taste horrible. Yeah, and, and that's like one of the first examples of people going against the whole like taste theory, the taste hypothesis, right? Yeah, it's actually really frustrating to me, um, but you know, Consumers are a, a fickle mistress, I guess. So b before I go on about the the business, a question I have just broadly, you seem like someone who's very educated and knowledgeable in the sustainability food waste space. Can you just like pop on a soapbox quickly and talk to people about like, why is food waste such a huge problem? Why is it being ignored? Like where, you know, the, the grain use case that you're solving is probably one of many areas where there's so much food waste. Can you highlight a few others just so people... Have it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, food waste is, it's arguably the world's dumbest problem because it's super solvable. You're never going to have zero waste, but you should have a food system that does the most with the least amount of resources. Instead, what we're doing is we're spending a massive amount of, of money and, and resources in growing crops that are that are never eaten so like by the numbers in the u.s 40 it's you know i mentioned this earlier 40 percent of all food that's grown is wasted um you know there's a lot that goes into what you count you know what you measure as food waste and there's like nuance between food waste and food loss but that's just forget all that for, for right now we can get into it later you know that that amount of food that represents about 30 percent of all farmland just give you an idea so 30% of all farmland used to, to crops that are never eaten. I mean, the amount of water that's used to produce crops that are never eaten. And again, this is all based on the 40% number. So it's actually not counting brewer's grain. Um, and we can talk about that too. Uh, it's like, you know, Lake Geneva, right? Huge, huge, well, like world. Why is this lakes. happening? Like, there are three times, three, yeah, three, ti three times the amount, you know, it's like, and it's a, it's a big problem too, because when, when organic material makes it into like landfill as a destination, it breaks down into methane, which is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. It's uh, significantly more potent than carbon dioxide. Like if you were to measure food waste as a country and look at greenhouse gas emissions around the world, it would be the third largest defender. So there's like the US and China and then food waste as an aggregate because so much food is making it into, and then it's a lot of money. It's billions of dollars in the US alone. It's like over $200 billion a year spent growing and processing, transporting, you know, and disposing of food that is edible. Meanwhile, it's like it's somewhere between one in seven and one in eight people are food insecure. And it's important not to completely conflate these two issues because like food waste doesn't cause hunger. Right. But it's just obviously a huge. Yeah, there should be a stronger connection there. Somehow. Yeah. And there's a lot of breakdowns. So like if you look at like where the food waste is happening, actually more than you would expect is happening at home. So as and that, that's one of the things we're really excited about using our consumer brand for is talking to getting people to think about how they buy and prepare and eat food in their homes because about 40% of the, of the problem is at home. So folks, even someone, 
and actually I have this hot take that like COVID is a really good opportunity for people to waste less food at home because we're forced to meal plan for the first time because it's a huge pain in the ass to go to the grocery store. And in some cases, depending on who you are, like dangerous. And so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of foods wasted at home. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, a decent amount happens at the farm level too. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, actually one of the kind of poster child examples of the food waste movement is um, ugly fruits and vegetables. So things that don't meet the cosmetic standards of the grocery store. They're a great partner of ours too, this company in Perfect Foods. You know, they built their whole, whole business around buying produce from growers that otherwise wouldn't have made it into, into distribution. And then they create these farm boxes, you know, so like if you're sitting at home, you know, you can get like organic or conventional produce, perfectly good, you know, just like maybe it's too big or too small or too curvy or scarred. Most of it, you can't even tell what's wrong with it. And so it's a, like the food waste world has been really ripe for like on. Actually, that's not an intentional pun uh, for entrepreneurial uh, innovation because there's it, it's and this isn't true for all environmental problems, but for food waste, there's a lot of opportunity to create like for profit solutions that also solve these these environmental problems. And I think it's an extremely exciting space for that reason because it kind of checks those boxes of you know doing doing well by by doing good. And I think that you know that leads to this feeling of just like purpose and passion and, you know, something that you want to dedicate your life's work to. A question I have as I listen to you is around like prioritization. So I feel like good CEOs, at least that I've read about, they're really good allocators of capital, allocators of resources. It's like one of the main jobs of, that they have. For you guys, it sounds like there's so much opportunity, right? You got your consumer brand, you have the, the wholesale brand, you have which partnerships do we chase after, you have the grain versus other food waste problems you could solve. How do you think about prioritization when you look micro into the business and then I'm sure you're getting investor pressure to scale bigger, faster in other places. It is not easy to do, you know, for the, the reasons you outlined. There is our idea is so simple at its core that there's so many different directions that we can be pulled. And what we try to keep as our just like, you know, North Star in this is making sure that all activities that we're doing are, you know, are are building the market, like demand First, you know, I think is really the an important important lens to look at this as opposed to you know focusing on you know supply because there's like a ton that can be done on the supply side too. But without demand, the market will never develop to the point where we will be able to serve it, you know, with with the supply. And so the consumer brand, even though it's not a long-term focus, it's a really important instrument for reaching consumers. And it also acts as a as a tool for our partnerships with other companies they see what we're doing as a consumer brand and and in some cases they come to us and say hey we would love to to look at you know doing some upcycle you know innovation together what that looks like in practice is and i was mentioning this a little bit earlier like we're not chasing every small opportunity we can to at random bakeries or um, various you know small restaurants and things like that using this ingredient we will we will get to that you know we will that will be possible if we're successful also at first, like working with some of these, these bigger players out there. And it's also, when you look at like impact, which is a really important lens for us to look through too, is like, how do how can we make the most environmental impact through our business? And we can do a lot more by being a little tugboat for these gigantic container ships of these, you know, few, huge food companies and helping to lead them in a more sustainable direction, even though it might take a bit longer it's, you know, you're really poking at what is, I think, one of my, not not one of my strengths, frankly, honestly, as, as a CEO, is that I, I do get very excited about all the different things that we can be doing. And it's something that I need, and I'm always working on improving, you know, my ability as the leader of this organization to not just look at all the things that we can be doing, but, you know, focusing on what we what we should be doing to be successful at developing this this market that we seek to serve. Usually I ask like a question around like manifesting your, your future vision. You've painted a good picture around like what you guys could be doing. And I think for you, it seems like it's just a matter of timing. Like when things come to a head and that, that exponential curve, you know, one or two key players start really funneling demand. A question I have there is what do you think's holding back the, the Kellogg's and the, the big, huge players that you're trying to be that tugboat for other than just like the slow bureaucracy of their organization? Is there any other factor? Well, that is like central to the factor. They're just not agile, you know, and they're, and what's important to remember is that at these big companies, 
they're made up of people, right? And a lot of, there are innovative people at these big companies that are doing some great work. And that's, I, I just think important to, to recognize that it's even internally, a lot of times there is the desire to be more agile and to move faster, but there's so many layers in the decision-making process. And so I think one way to think about it is like with these big companies, a lot of focus is spent on not making mistakes. Yeah. Defensive behavior. Yeah. As opposed to putting creativity in action and taking some risks. And so, you know, what I'd like to see more of, and this is what we, you know, work into our our partnership model is, is working with these companies too, to not like, we're not saying if you're, uh, I think you've, you've used, uh, Kellogg, right, as, as an example, a few times, like, we're not saying, hey, Kellogg, like, we need you to put, you know, they own, like, Kashi is just one, one, one of the many brands that they, they own, right? Like, you don't need to put this in every single Kashi product, you know, from, from the beginning, like, what if we were to create another brand for you to test and do some of this innovation within that can fail, that has permission to fail internally, that's not going to, necessarily detract from the brand equity, you know, of the, of the bigger company. And so trying to like get them to think, you know, differently about how they can bring products to market faster and pilot ideas um, and do like revenue generating learning basically uh, without, because historically a lot of what the, you know, the big companies do is they just, they buy the innovative companies and in some cases they're successful at integrating them into the, into the business. It's usually if they're successful, it means they allow some, level of autonomy to continue to exist from the, you know, the, the portfolio company, as opposed to just trying to absorb it into the big melting pot of the, you know, large corporate structure. First of all, it's not very, not a very effective way to be innovative because in a lot of cases they end up just like strangling the innovative spirit of the company that gets bought. You know, then there's like this model of making minority investments, which I think is a great step in the right direction. And then there's another kind of step beyond that where there is like creative commercial partnership models that could help, you know, be help these big companies be more agile in their development by marrying their strengths. Like they are expert at producing, distributing, marketing, you know, selling food products, right? You know, smaller food companies were great at coming up, you know, being on on the trends and, you know, being innovative. And, you know, is there opportunity to to work together to marry those those strengths in a way that's not an acquisition or not even an investment necessarily, but just a commercial relationship to bring products to market uh, together? And that, like that's the type of structure that we really try to put out there as 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 an option that that sometimes folks aren't even aren't even thinking of. Yeah, it's surprising, and, and this probably exists, and I I just am unaware. But it's surprising that they don't have like a almost like a creativity hub where any small business or any you know startup in the space, complementary or otherwise, can just come in and just like play with the resources. Like we'll, we'll fund a couple million dollars, and I know it's like for them a couple million dollars of R and D is nothing. Yeah, so, so it's, it's like a, it's a rounding error. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll fund a couple million dollars and a couple of people, and you'll have a lab, and you'll have all yeah. the ingredients you need, and test, and when things work. Like then we'll come in and think about giving a side investment, like that earlier step of pre-investment. So there, so the, so there is some of that starting to happen. That's okay, been, nice. It, that's been encouraging. I mean, so like one of our investors is is Barilla Group, right? We know them as the Italian the Italian food company, and um, yeah, mostly for for pasta, right? But they actually own a, a large number of, of other types of brands doing snacks and all, and all kinds of good stuff. And you know, they have a, a great like open innovation you know program, and you know, they work with startups. Many of these big companies have have things you know like this now. We actually did a kind of corporate matchmaking program uh, through Rabobank, actually their big food and ag bank, and that was like a it's called the Terra program. And we got you know matches like startups, emerging brands, with bigger companies on like innovation pilots. And so the the swell is there, you know, and the infrastructure is starting to be there for that. And what what needs to happen next, I think, is more appetite, if you will, for like the actual commercialization, you know, side of those of those ideas and you know, there's a lot of risk aversion, right? And there's, you know, they want to wait until the market's approved or ideas are, are approved. And like a big company is actually, it's better for them strategically in a lot of cases to not be the first to market because what they can do is they can wait till something's like seems to, you know, be proven and they can come in with more resources and know-how and just, you know, do it, do it bigger. Yeah, so buy it and scale it. It's kind of strategic to be slow. But then you see a lot of these big companies losing market share to the, to the smaller ones too, right? So I think that the, you know, we are starting to see some of these like system level, you know, thinking shifts. And 
you know, in a lot of cases, like the way that I like to sum up the way that we think about it is that, you know, working with like big companies, like we're, we're not here to try and reinvent the wheel. It's just about more about like where the wheel's going. Totally. I want to shift to some of these other questions more like around your personal experience as a founder. One is around hiring. So I personally think the hiring process and, and getting good people is the most important thing you can do as a leader, as a founder. And it seems consistent across a lot of the people I've talked to on the show. For you, what characteristics have proven to be consistent qualities across like the superstar people that you've, you have on your team? Yeah, it's a good question. It is like the most important thing you can do as a CEO or founder is like hire people that are, that are smarter than you, right? And it's a lot of it's like stage dependent. So we're still a really small team. There's uh, right now very small. It's very different than when you're, you know, when you're hiring your like fifth and sixth employee is very different than when you're hiring, you know, your hundredth employee, right? It tends to like in the, at an earlier stage, what's really important to look for are folks that have like a, an entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, are comfortable and, you know, finding opportunity and in, in chaos, right? And like, not bringing problems to management, but bringing solutions to management, right? Or solving the, you know, solving the problem and then reporting on what the problem was and the solution that you affected and the result of that, like that, that's even better. Um, Cause we're all doing so much that we can't have a big, like, you know, cuddle puddle for every single problem that comes up as a, as, as a business. But then it becomes important pretty quickly to also have people that, have a you know they, they need to have a lane you know that they're that they're focused in and, and the roles need to become more defined you know over time too so like starting to focus you know like having someone that's like in charge of sales right uh, someone that's you know all they think about is is operations and getting into from more like the generalist to the specialist i guess it's tough like what i've done today is i've hired you know because we've also been small and it's really scrappy and like pretty underfunded overall you know most likely like you know uh, is hiring like for you know like a lot of like young talent that's like passionate and has you know has a lot of potential you know now we're now at that point where it's time to like bring in um you know we already have brought in a few like seasoned you know really seasoned people it's one of those things that uh i think we always need to be thinking about how to you know do better and meeting like you want to be meeting the next hire like before you need to hire them right because by the time you have that need it's probably too late i totally agree with that and i i think what's interesting now you know specific to this environment is there's a lot of LinkedIn employees that got laid off or like insert other impressive big company here that cut X percent of their workforce. And like, there might never be another time or an easier time for startups to be able to get that top talent who's like hungry for an opportunity and like to prove their worth. But on the other side of that coin, right, because of COVID, a lot of startups have scaled down and lost funding and can't bring someone on. So it's a really interesting like seesaw in my mind. Yeah. And also like the idea of uh, how you build a remote culture, right? So if you're hiring right now and you're not together, does that mean that it's okay? Does that mean that I should be instead of like work place is going to look like expensive market and we're in the food business. We're not, you know, a SaaS company, right? So, you know, maybe, maybe it's okay to look for someone that's, that's living somewhere else. And if we've got, you know, a, a remote culture, it's just like there's so many it's such a moving target right now with what the like work place is going to look like yeah kind of a two parter here around lessons learned or words of advice so the first is what's what's like the best piece or a couple pieces of advice you've gotten along the way from mentors and then the other would be from that you've learned from like investor pitches or from investors that either went well or went poorly yeah so on the first i think it kind of hits on the theme that we were talking about before, which is just really internalizing the fact that like, as, as the founder, as the CEO, whatever, like your job isn't to know everything, right. Your job is to put together a team that, that knows more than you. And like really central to that is, you know, being willing to just like ask for help. Right. And to not be shy and, and, and asks, cause like, so I think a lot of people are worried about the perception of like seeming like they don't know what they're talking about. And it's like, no one knows what they're talking about. You know, and the people that know more, like at one point knew less, you know, and a lot, and it's, you just, you, you don't, it's kind of like the, the, the sports setting. It's like Wayne Gretzky, right? Like you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. I'm, I'm not a sports ball guy really. So if I attributed that to the wrong athlete, I apologize. But it's, it's kind of like that question. Like you don't, you get, you know, you, you don't, get answers to 100 percent of the questions you know you, you don't ask and so it's like you know ask it's a big part of especially at an early stage is 
building up a network of people that you can go to for different types of, of asks. And, you know, you, they, you, people talk about like formal advisory relationships a lot, but there's for us, like I would just like develop this, you know, ecosystem, this like community of advisors that, that range from different, like I have friends from grad school that, you know, I have a buddy that like we, we just creatively jive really well together. And when I'm working on copy for something, you know, like, like writing a piece for, you know, some, like op-ed or, or something like that. A lot of times I'll like run up by him and he's like an advisor to the business in that, in that, in that way. Um, you know, there's other folks that are like really experienced in finance or, or, or whatever it is. Like they don't all have to have formal advisory relationships where they know about like everything that's going on in the business and they're expected to be this like Swiss army knife. It's like, you know, have, um, you know, build up this network of people that, that you can go to when you don't know something. And it's like, people care, you know, and I think a, a lot of people that kind of underestimate generous other people are with their, you know, the value that they're willing to offer to, to others without compensation even necessarily. On the investor side, this isn't something that I learned from an investor. It's hopefully the way I answer this is okay. It's a little bit different than what you asked, but like when raising money, you know, when it's something like, and, and then bringing on investors, one of the like best uh, like learnings I think I've had over, the, over time, or at least it's, it's, it's snappy at least, um, is that when you're, when you're raising money, there's like a, there's, I believe there's three types of capital that's out there. There's the, you know, sources of money. There's, there's smart money. So there's, you know, people that bring more to the table than just the the cash, right? They bring strategic value um, to the business, you know, through their relationships. Then there's cash money, which are investors that just want to give you their money. They don't need to be, they don't want to be involved. They don't need to be involved. And that's great too. You need, you need both of that. Right? You also, you don't want to have too much smart money on the table or you can kind of create conflict. But then there's this third category of investors that are out there that should be cash money, but think they're smart money. And it's really important for founders to figure out who's in that category. Usually there's a lot of ego involved and things like that. And, and stay away from those people. Yeah. And it's like, it's important to remember that like raising money is a, is a two way street, you know, and you're, you're both should date each other uh, a bit and, and make sure that you want the same things. Cause there might be, you, know, you might find yourself in a situation where you take money from an investor that, um, you know, has, has strings or, or chains attached to it that, is more than what your is is good for the business or for or for you, and uh, it's okay to say no. You know, I've said no to investors before, and it's not that they're bad people or anything like that. It just didn't the expectations weren't a fit. A question I love to ask, and it's a, it's a tough one because you know you you needed to go through all the steps and all the trials and all the failures that you've gone through to get to where you are, right? To make those decisions. But if you could teleport back to the first couple months you were starting and maybe answer this in two parts. One, like when you were very, very first starting making the beer, making the bread, and then fast forward to like 2016 ish, what would you have told yourself then? Yeah. Very beginning. I think I would have told us to find other co-founders, like have a, a broader, I mean, it was just the two of us. It was just me and me and Jordan, you know, really early on. And we had great complementary skills for the early stages, but like, for example, we didn't, uh, neither of us had a technical background, you know, in our case, which would mean like food science or, or product development. Um, and neither of us also had like a super strong, like financial you know, background. I mean, we we're college students, right? Like, I think starting, if, if I were to, and maybe it'd be different if I were to like start another business like now, but if I were to go back to when I was like 20, you know, starting, starting a business, I think I would want to start with like four of us. That, that probably, who knows, like probably could have created its own, its own problems. But, and then in, you know, fast forwarding to, 2016, you know, 17, like right when we were starting to go full time. This is tricky, but what I want to say is that I would have, I would have said, hey, this nutrition bar product line is going to be more headache, you know, than it's than it's worth. And also, fo and also focus. Realize you're not a packaging company, and because we we had just created a massive resource sink in both time and money to deal with this compostable packaging issue that was just like a, uh, you know, we were being true to our values. Like I stand behind it, but in a lot of ways, but it was. A, a big distraction in a lot of ways and, and also very, very costly. I mean, it's always going to be starting a business. It's always going to be like one step forward, two steps back or two steps forward, one step back. Right. Yeah. Hopefully it's not one step forward, two steps back. <laughs> right. You'll and, end up dead. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, but sometimes it is, <laughs> you know, and it's, yeah, it just depends on how many steps forward you took before that happened. And so it's not that I would have like cautioned against the consumer brand side of it, but I think I would have tell myself to really look at the category, you know, of, of the bar and, and consider like bringing this, you know, this puff product or another, you know, category to, to market, you know, faster, you know, as opposed to um, being so, you know, having the bar be the only, the only product line for, for a little bit. 
question for you, like more broadly around either the food and ag industry or bro- or more broadly, what are some other market trends that you see emerging that you know you're either excited by as a consumer or if you put your investor hat on, you know would be attractive spaces to take a look at? I think in the future, you know, sustainability is going to be super, super core to just everything. Like it's not going to be, it's going to become a baseline expectation for customers where like, if you're not you know, doing something that's like environmentally responsible, it'll just be doomed, you know, from, from the start. And so, you know, I think that the, it's really important to stop looking at things that are like extractive or linear, you know, and, 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 and nature, but also, I mean, just, I guess more specific to food, I think, especially in this like post COVID world one of the silver linings and you know there's not many of them so i got a whole lot of the ones that are that exist is that i think for people are starting have a kind of a renewed sense of connection to, to food in a lot of ways and making more food at home you know having you know like we're seeing this huge boom and like home baking and gardening you know vegetable gardening and just having a, a deeper connection to um you know what and how we eat and like eating is one of those things that like we all make decisions at least three times a day in most cases about what and how to eat. And so, you know, what are the new business models that are going to you know, support that? Like, I mean, you know, meal kits and things like that are, are one thing that's going on, but I don't know. I just feel like there's, it, it's, it's, it's also the, for the end customer, it's that, you know, the, it's, they're very empowered to in, in these decisions and, uh, and what they make. And I just, I just think there's, we really need to think through, you know, what, what opportunities there are to, I guess, engage that that new trend and develop. But I think it's, I think it can be a really positive thing across across the long run. And I think, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of just entrepreneurial opportunity, you know, therein. I agree. I think that's one of the one of the spaces where we're going to see a lot of disruption, especially like, you know, rapid in the next six to twelve months. Things are going to start popping up. So I got three more questions for you. The first one is around learning and resources. So what what books, newsletters, podcasts, follows on social media, or any other resources would you recommend for either an aspiring founder, someone who's interested in entrepreneurship, or uh, food and sustainability? Yeah, I mean, podcasts are brilliant, and also audiobooks. But I've always loved like uh, this. But maybe this is also part of how I live my life. Is like I'm a very active person. I do a lot of like endurance sports too. It's so, like you know running, biking, um, skiing, climbing, and all that all that good stuff. And with podcasts and audiobooks. Uh, you know, and there's specific specific ones I can mention. It's like you can get your workout in and put knowledge in your brain at the same time, and that's like a great one of my favorite like entrepreneurial life hacks is like just going out on a on a you know long bike Two ride. Two for one, exactly. For me, I've always loved like founder story, you know, books and, and podcasts, and so the founder. Listen to the founder. Yeah, <laughs> this one exactly. They listen to this podcast. Um, but you know, things like um, like I, I listened for a few years, like every episode of you know how I built this and. Um, in the food in the food space, there's a great uh, podcast called Taste Radio and Project Nosh uh, or Bevnet. You know they have a few podcasts now. One's called Insider, I think, and one's called Taste Radio, and they put out some great stuff in the in the industry. But I personally, I I find a lot of inspiration actually from reading fiction, um, which is maybe not the most common answer to this to this question. I get a lot of my best ideas and perspective from from fiction frankly, and from, you know, I've actually heard that before. Yeah. Oh, that's great for me. Like I actually, I I mean, I I read plenty of nonfiction too. I actually mostly it's audiobooks because I like doing that when I'm, you know, on the move. But when I sit down and and, read, um, actually, I love science fiction and it gets me like kind of thinking, I especially love reading like some of the classics too and seeing like how they were thinking, you know, in the 60s even about like what came true and like what's like some of the stuff is still just so hauntingly relevant and you know gives just I think really just provocative perspective and that's uh, something that I really love totally that's great um, I'll link those up on our website all right so final two questions we ask these to every guest so I'm pumped to get your take the first one is the startup manifesto and I know you, you've probably integrated some of these lessons throughout, but if you had to write a startup manifesto with five of the most important key lessons or pitfalls to avoid when starting out, what would they be? All right, let's see how many I can come up with on the spot here. Um, one, take action on your ideas. Like so many people spend so much time just coming up with the perfect plan and they don't get to execution nearly fast enough. And you learn like so much when you when you get into to taking action on the ideas. Uh, don't, but when you do, don't let like, 
obsession with perfection get in the way of, of progress. I know you can go too far with that, like having a product that tastes like a good idea. But uh, like I was talking about earlier, getting something out there and then having a place to start from, you know, is, is, is really key. And I think um, then what you need to do is like hold all areas of the business subject to improvement at all times, you know, so it's this idea of, of iteration and of you know, constantly like looking at, you know, everything that you're, everything that you're doing and, and ways that you can do it better. I think it's also really important to think about not just your own little universe of what you're doing with your own business, but the fact that you're part of like a greater, you know, ecosystem. So for your business, like looking at, you know, how you, how you develop relationships, not just with your, with your customers, but with your suppliers and with various partners and really like finding win-wins, you know, and, and all those areas where you're like going forward together, um, I think is, 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 is really key. And then, yeah, the fifth one, I'm just going to go with like, don't burn out. <laughs> um it's 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 there's so much romanticizing of like burning the midnight oil and or burning the candle like all these like you know, burning the candle at both ends or whatever and like just just hustling and you know not sleeping and putting your business you know had a family and all this stuff and i just think that's a load of crap you know i it doesn't work like it's it's even when it's it's just so important to have balance you know and and actually having things that can create space for you to do you know your thinking and to find you know, inspiration is so key. And that's frankly, one of the things that's been so hard in this like COVID, you know, running a business during COVID is like, am I working from home or am I living at work? Right. And um, yeah, it feels like there's no off button. There's no off button. And it's like, I, I, it's, it's exhausting, you know? And I think it's just, it's just really, even if it's just going out for like a few hours and just putting on some, some music and just not even like trying to think about something and then thinking will happen as a byproduct of that. Right. And I, I, and I think that you just gotta like, take care of yourself and stay sane or you're not going to be able to see your vision through. That's a solid list. And I think like for me, like going to the gym was like religious and in New York, their gyms, uh, some places they're starting to open, but New York, they're still closed. I, I haven't lifted for five months or whatever. And that's, that's brutal for, cause I was using that time to like re you know, decompress, reset, think about stuff. So I totally hear you. The, the second question that we ask everyone is a nomination. So Lisa Curtis from Cooley Cooley nominated you. And this is a great way we've, we've used to build the show and get like a really awesome collective of, of founders that have come on. So it's your turn to nominate another founder that is either a friend, colleague, or mentor of yours that you'd like to see on the show. Yeah. Um, you know what? I am going to, there's a little bit of self-interest in this, but it's, you know, he's, he's, he's awesome. And I, I think you'll, you'll enjoy speaking. Uh, Turner Wyatt, who's the CEO and founder of the Upcycled Food Association that, that we founded together. It's a bit of a you know, he's uh, taking a really interesting approach to rally. It's a nonprofit, but rallying, you know, a bunch of potential competitors even together to try to build a movement together. And, and I think doing a, doing a great, great job of it. So I'd love to nominate him if, if you'll have him. Yeah, that's awesome. We'd love to talk to him. Before we wrap, I just want to acknowledge you for a second. I think, you know, in listening to the story and, and hearing you talk, the, the vision is, is crazy. I, I think I always find it really, really inspiring when, we, when I talk to people that created a category and created a market because I feel like a there's no playbook for really any business, but especially if you're making a creating a market from scratch, there is just no playbook. And to be able to grind and grit for this long and and to have the success you've had, I think is really inspiring. So I took that away, and I hope I hope people who listen take that as way away as well. Oh, thank you so much. It was just great to take a step back, you know, and you know this conversation is going to help remind. Yeah, it's like they'll see the forest for the trees kind of thing. And uh, this is you know, this conversation was very energizing in that, in that respect. So thank you for having me. For sure. Yeah. Before you go, um, do you want to just plug your website and your social so people know where to find you? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the company is Regrained, R-E-G-R-A-I-N-E-D. And we're just regrained.com. We're at Regrained on all, the, on all the channels. I'm just Dan at Regrained. People hit me up all the time. And I'm, I'd am i love to just engage with you know whoever wants to, to get in touch. You know, we're not not gonna be able to do anything if we don't do it together. So um, yeah, thanks for thanks for listening and hope to hear for some some of you soon. Dan Kurzrock, founder of Regrain. Cheers. Thank you for listening to that episode with Dan Kurzrock of Regrain. If you want to support the show, there's a couple quick things you could do that would really help us out. One, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. If you go on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a five star rating and a couple sentence positive review on why the show inspired you. 
These ratings and reviews are super important, and they signal to Apple that they should put our show in front of other people that might like it. Two, follow us on Instagram at Founder Podcast. Each week we put out teasers, audio clips, and important quotes from the episode. And lastly, check out our website as a mission control for the show. Go to thefounderpod.com. We have a page on there called Special Offers where we link up all the discount codes across all of our founders' companies, as well as the books and resources that have been recommended. I hope you enjoyed that episode and are looking forward to the next one. Until then, I'm Callaway, and this is The Founder. Founder.